Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad to see everyone out this morning. I know we have a number of visitors, and after talking with some of you, I found out you have come a long distance, many of you, to be with us, and so we are so glad and happy that you have chosen to assemble with us. Your presence is a great encouragement to us as we get to meet saints from around the country. And we also want to welcome those tuning in on our live stream through our Facebook page and want to say we're having internet difficulties. <laughs> We've been all morning, and so hopefully that does not uh, affect the video. If it does, just remember it'll be on our website later on tonight, uh, the recording from the presentation, as well as the audio. So if you miss any portion of it, you can catch up with it this evening as it's on the website. This morning's lesson is entitled, Can You Afford Not To? And I have labeled part one, and you have to wait two weeks for part two, because next week you're in for a treat. I'm going to be in Ohio, uh, in Columbus, actually, at the Laurel Canyon Church of Christ, bringing greetings from courthouse to them as I present a gospel meeting. Uh, this is the reschedule from last April. I was supposed to be there last April. We all know what happened last year. So this is the reschedule. And you're in for a treat next week as Leon has uh, volunteered to take the pulpit next week. And so I know you're all looking forward to that. And so the week after that, we'll look at part two. So, can you afford not to? Take your text from 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9. Go ahead and turn there with me this morning. 2 Thessalonians 1, starting in verse 6. It says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. This is going to serve as our base text as it paints a picture of two vastly different categories of people. Those that do not know God and those who have never obeyed the gospel, it says, are going to pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of God. And on that same day, Jesus will return with his saints to be glorified with his saints and be marveled among all who have believed. So you have one category that's going to receive retribution, vengeance, the wrath of God, and another category of people that are going to be glorified and marvel at his coming. I want to pause the presentation for just a second and tell you where this, this uh, presentation is coming from. Becky and I recently attended a sales pitch, one that we had very high sales resistance, but we were very impressed with the way it was presented. And I just want to share with you some tidbits from that. One, they wouldn't talk price at all. No matter how many questions were brought up front, they said, no, 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 that's something we're going to talk about later. They didn't even talk about their product at first. No, they didn't even want to tell you about the product. What they wanted to do was start off by telling you how bad your life is without their product. And they started out by a question on their presentation saying, can you afford not to? That was the question that was posed. Can you afford not to? And what they did was they showed they had a calculator that was set up on the PowerPoint and they had an average of costs of doing things without their product. And they said, this is the average cost you're going to pay without using our services. And so then they, they asked again, can you afford not to? And it was at the end of the presentation that they started selling you on the benefits of their product. And at the very end... Did they talk cost? <laughs> you know, in teaching the gospel, when we teach the gospel to others, we very often speak about the cost of discipleship up front. We talk about how it is a commitment. And we're going to talk about this in greater detail in part two. How it is persecution. There will be persecution. There will be people that hate you because of who you are. There is loss of relationships. From Luke 21, 16 to 17. And we're going to talk about all of this in part two in greater detail. Because at the very beginning, I thought this would be a great way to look at the gospel. And just ask when considering to become a Christian or not, 
Can you afford not to? So let's talk about what life would look like without Christ. If you were to choose the world, there are physical costs. One, it is free. It costs nothing to go to hell. You absolutely have to do nothing. There is no sacrifice for you to make in order to go to hell. It is basically the sin of omission. You just keep doing what you've always done. In Matthew 7, 13 to 14, Jesus describes two roads. And he describes these two roads lead to two vastly different outcomes. He describes the road, the broad road, the broad way. He says this leads to destruction. And then there's a narrow way that leads to life. He says few will find the narrow road to life while many are on that broad road. Therefore, whenever I present this, especially if we go in detail on Matthew 7, 13 and 14, and there are whole lessons that can be made out of these two roads, I often refer to as the broad road as the party road. Because mostly that's where almost everyone you know is going to be on that road. They're on that broad road. And so all you have to do, if you want to choose the world and the physical costs that come with it, is stay on that broad road to destruction. No need to look for the exit saying narrow way, find Christ, follow him. There's no need for that. It's free. You can just stay on that broad road to your eternal destruction. Stay in the world. Stay in darkness. Don't seek Christ. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you have no plans to see God on friendly terms, there's no cost to you. You just stay on that broad road. You just stay in the darkness as Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 describes it. If you were to read Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, it's going to describe life outside of Christ as darkness, following after your own desires, being children of wrath, being children of disobedience, people upon whom the wrath of God is set to fall upon. But if you just want to choose the world and all that comes with it, there costs nothing to go to hell. But there are consequences for sin. That is something that people will pay. There are consequences. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. This list consists of several evil practices that have very physical consequences. Now, as we look through this list, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Go ahead and turn over there with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 10. And it's going to describe practices in life that are, were prevalent in that first century and prevalent still today. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This list consists of, consists of several evil practices that have physical consequences. Diseases, broken families, arrests. 1 Peter 4.15 talks about that if you want to be a Christian, you're not to suffer as a lawbreaker. There are these, This list leads to murders. James 4.1-2 says when you covet and you don't have, you will murder for it. He talks about giving in the lust. Accidents that can kill or injure. He talks about drunkenness. These will all ultimately cost you the loss of heaven. These will all ultimately cost you your soul. Choosing the world and physical costs, there are unanswered prayers. Prayers not heard or answered. 1 Peter 3, 10 to 12 says, God hears the prayers of the righteous, but turns his face from the wicked. Now there's going to be those that say, well, what about Saul of Tarsus? What about Cornelius? Acts chapter 9, 11 through 12, Paul was praying as Saul of Tarsus. He was praying and he needed Ananias to come and teach him. In Acts 10, 30 through 33, we find at the beginning of the chapter, Cornelius was praying. He tells Peter when Peter comes to his house, because he, he was told to send for Peter. Peter comes and, the, the, and uh, verses 30 through 33 is Cornelius telling Peter in his own words why he sent for him. And he says, now we're all gathered to hear what God has commanded you to tell us. 
so a heart searching for truth may find it. God may lead someone else into their life to teach them what they need to do. But he simply tells us that God hears the prayers of the righteous, but he turns his face away from the wicked. Can you afford not to be in the family of God? Knowing there will be physical consequences, knowing that one of the greatest blessings that Christians have, the avenue of prayer, is removed from you. Can you afford not to be in the family of God? But if this doesn't convince you to want to be a Christian, perhaps talking about the eternal costs, there are those in this world that teach that this is all there is. When you die, you die, and there's nothing left. The scriptures teach something vastly different. There is another life. And there is a life in two different ways. There is hell and there is heaven. There, are, there is no option C. Those are the two options. On a day of judgment, when Jesus separates those to his right and to his left, the right into eternal life, the left into eternal punishment, and that is what is under consideration here. It is referred to as the second death. In Revelation 20, 11 through 15, we get a picture painted of that great white throne that all the nations, small and great, are gathered in front of. Books are opened. The book of life is opened. And the deep book of deeds is opened. And the book of deeds is read. And mankind is judged by what is written there. And if anyone's name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, he is thrown into the lake that burns with fire. And it tells us twice, both in verse 14 and 15, this is called the second death. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, physical death happens once and then begins judgment. It says it's appointed for man to die once and then comes the judgment. Eternal costs is eternal destruction. We just read 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10 as we began this morning. Telling us that those that do not know God, those who have never obeyed the gospel, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of God. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Philippians 3, 18 and 19 tells us the end of worldly people is destruction. Now, there are those that take this destruction and say, see, that means it's annihilation. You're extinct. There's no, nothing left to punish. That's not how this Greek word is used. Vines tells us that this destruction is not extinction, but it is ruin, loss, not of being, but of well-being. So think about being eternally destroyed and yet not fully extinct. That's what awaits those who want to remain on that broad road that leads to destruction. An eternity of being destroyed, but not fully extinct. And along with that is an eternity away from Jesus. Second Thessalonians one and verse nine in life. We have the ability to repent. That is to change course. We can cry out to God for forgiveness. We can obey the gospel. When we come to that decision, we can change our course. But in hell, eternally away from the presence of the Lord, there is no one to hear your cries for mercy. Who would you cry out to if we are eternally away from the presence of the Lord? One of the eternal costs is the eternal fire. Many of you that know me know that one of my greatest fears is to be burned alive. <laughs> that, would be, that would be something that would terrify me. And so when we read of the descriptors of hell, and Jesus talks about the descriptors of hell far more than he does of heaven. And so we know a lot more about the picture of hell than we actually do of heaven. Because Jesus' point in this life was to tell people, if you want to follow me, avoid this place at all costs. Even if it means your physical life, don't let your immortal, eternal soul go to this place. And so Jesus describes it as a place of eternal fire. In Matthew 25, 41, he describes it as a place of eternal fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels. So many times in our, in our worlds, in our society, and I don't know where, how far back it goes, but it goes back quite a ways. We have this idea that Satan is the ruler of hell and that he sends out his demons to do his bidding. Satan isn't the ruler of hell. Hell is his eternal prison, the same as those who are on that broad road. Satan will be a fellow inmate along with his followers. So I want you to think of the company that you will keep 
as we look at this brochure to this destination of eternity. Satan, his angels, that's his demons, and then all those who have given their lives over to him, either willingly or unwillingly. Revelation 20, 14 to 15 describes it as a lake of fire and brimstone. So that gives us a, a visual. What does eternal fire look like? A lake of fire and brimstone. So now we have a smell associated with it too, right? That smell of brimstone, sulfur. Now we have an idea of what this is going to look like, what it's going to smell like. Mark 9 uh, or uh, 21 verse 8 in Revelation talks about it, it being again the lake of fire, the second death. And Mark 9, 42 to 48, Jesus paints a terrifying word picture for me. Because as I stated, I don't want to be in a fire. And Jesus describes in Mark 9, 42 to 48, he describes it as a fire that is unquenched. And he repeats it three times. A fire that is unquenched. And later on, along with this passage, the worm that does not die. What he's doing is painting a picture of something that goes on and on and on and never fully consumes you. So you burn and you burn and you burn, but are yet never fully consumed. It is a fire that is unquenched. That is a fire that is never fully satisfied. And it is a fire that is never put out. Along with that eternal fire, it's described as punishment. An eternal punishment. Matthew 25, 46, as Jesus gives us a picture of that throne room scene that John later sees in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. As Jesus gathers the nations, the small and the great before him. And he separates them like the shepherd that he is, the righteous to his right, the unrighteous to his left. When he gets to verse 46, he says, Jesus turns his attention to those on his left. And he says, depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then tells them why that they are there. And then in verse 46, he says, these will go away into eternal punishment. These, the wicked, will go away into eternal punishment. And there are those that like to say that God is so loving, he is so just, that he could never send someone to hell. But yet the same word in that very same passage uses the word eternal twice or everlasting, forever. However you want to look at it, the Greek word that means eternally, that is without end. He says these go away into eternal punishment, speaking to those on his right, but the righteous into eternal life. You see, you can't have heaven without hell. You can't have hell without heaven. Jesus speaks of them both as being eternal. And God has prepared hell. A place of eternal fire is punishment for the wicked. Romans twelve nineteen. As saints are reminded not to take our own vengeance. He quotes that Old Testament passage again and says it applies to Christians today. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So the Apostle Paul, through the Spirit, is telling Christians, don't take your own vengeance. Leave that for God. God has prepared a place of eternal punishment where his vengeance on the unjust will forever take place. There's nothing we can do to another individual that could ever take the place of the vengeance that God has planned for those that don't know him and those who do not obey him. One of the costs of choosing hell is eternal darkness. Matthew 22, verse 13, and Matthew 25, and verse 30. The Lord talked about darkness in relationship to torment and punishment in the parables of the marriage feast and the parable of the talent. And in both places, he says, throw them out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, gives us a picture of what hell is. And this word picture paints for us again another sights and sounds and smells. Place of sulfur. Place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It says there in 2 Peter 2 and verse 17. It refers to angels that are reserved for punishment. And then he talks about the ungodly. He says he knows how to rescue the godly as in the place, as in the example of Lot. And then it says he knows how to reserve the wicked for punishment. And it talks about those angels, those sinful angels being in pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Hell will consist of black darkness 
forever. Jude verses 12 and 13 describes a place. He says a place that is reserved of the blackest darkness forever. Remember Mark 9, 43 to 44 describes hell as a place of unquenchable fire, a lake of fire. It makes me wonder if that eternal darkness may be due to the smoke. Again, if that's the case, then adding to the sights and the smells and the sounds that would be in such a place as that. Imagine the horror of confinement in a place of permanent, perpetual darkness. And eternal perishing. Mark 9, 42 to 48, one of those horrible word pictures Jesus paints along with the unquenchable fire. He says, where their worm does not die. This implies perishing without ever fully being consumed. Another way to say it is an eternal decaying process. An eternity of decaying, but never fully decaying. Never fully passing off, passing away. It's a terrible terrible word picture Jesus paints. The worm that does not die and is constantly eating at you, but never fully satisfied, doesn't go away, and you're never fully consumed. Jesus' point in painting these awful pictures for us is Jesus says, avoid this place at all costs. And in fact, in Mark 9, 42 to 48, he's talking about if your foot, if your eye, if your hand sins, And you can't stop it from sinning. You might need to cast it off because it's better to go into hell maimed than go into hell full. Or go into, it's better to go into heaven maimed than to go into heaven or go into hell full. Jesus is talking about making sacrifices and making costs, paying the costs to not go to such a place. Because he says it is eternally awful. And it's described as torment. Choosing hell, one of the eternal costs, is eternal torment. Revelation 14, 9 to 11 says, The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Revelation 20 and verse 15 describes those whose names are not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire called the second death. You know, in Luke 16, 22 to 24, this is not the judgment day. This is the place of the receptacle of the dead, the holding place, that there is a judgment that takes place at death. Jesus tells a story of Lazarus, the poor man and the rich man. And he tells us Lazarus, the poor man who begged at the rich man's gates just for any scraps. And the rich man was pretty harsh to him. This man dies and he's carried away by the angels. And then he focuses his attention on the rich man. He says the rich man dies, he's buried, and he awakes, opens his eyes in torment. Two, two different places. And he can see the bliss that the poor man is in. And he speaks to Abraham, who is holding and caring for this poor man. And he says, send him over with water. I'm in agony in this flame. So even in the receptacle of the dead, as we await that terrible day of judgment, there's a separation that takes place. And there is punishment already happening for those waiting for judgment. And the rich man says, send Lazarus over with some water because I'm in agony in this flame. And Abraham says, oh, no, there's an abyss, a chasm between us. No one can cross over to either side. Well, then send him back to my family. I don't want my five brothers to be here with me. Oh, no, you can't cross over there either. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Oh, no, Father Abraham. But they'll listen to someone who comes back from the dead. And Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen to one who comes back from the dead. And then Jesus plays that out in real in real time, doesn't he? He comes back. They didn't listen. The Jews still had a hard time obeying him. But the rich man awoke in Hades, awaiting judgment, and he says he was in torment. But as we look at this sales pitch, if you will, of what your life looks like without Christ, what good would a sales pitch be without reviews? The reviews are in. I am in torment here in Hades and such agony in this flame. I don't want my family to be here with me. 
I can only imagine what awaits me in hell. This is what I would summarize what the rich man must have said in Luke 16, 22 to 24 and verses 27 to 28. See also Revelation 20, 14 to 15 as it describes that lake of fire that Hades is dumped into. It tells us that Hades will be emptied into that lake of fire once judgment has been pronounced. Or this review. It is so dark here awaiting punishment, we can't imagine what hell will be like. We can't see our hands in front of our faces. I imagine this is what the sinful angels in eternal bonds awaiting judgment in eternal darkness might be saying. From 2 Peter 2 and verse 4 and Jude verse 6. So the question is again, can you afford not to be written in the book of life on the day of judgment? Can you afford not to become a Christian? The descriptors of hell should cause us to stop and think about life. Life leads men to two choices, eternal life or eternal punishment. That's Matthew 25 and verse 46. And choosing to live without Christ ultimately costs the most precious thing in your possession. And that is your soul. In Matthew 16, verse 26, Jesus says, What would it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and forfeit or lose his soul? No matter how successful you might be in life, the most important decision that you can make is to follow Christ. Because without him, the ultimate cost is your soul. And as we talked about, there are some steep costs to not following Christ. You must have your name in the Lamb's book of life if you want to live forever with God Almighty in heaven. The home that Jesus has gone to prepare in John 14, 1 through 3. In Revelation 20, 11 to 15, as it describes this judgment scene, it says anyone whose name is not found in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So this morning I ask again, can you afford not to become a Christian? Can you afford not to become a Christian? And this morning, if you are not a Christian sitting here with us this morning, you stand condemned already. There's nothing more you need to do but to accept the fate that Christ has laid out on that broad road that leads to eternal destruction. But, but if this is not the road you want, if these are not the costs you want, you can repent of your sins. You can be baptized into the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Second Thessalonians 1, 6 to 9 says, Those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the commands of the gospel, they ought to weigh the consequences because it leads to a penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. And this morning, if you are here as a Christian in error, not living the way that you should, perhaps struggling with sin, Remember, his promise of eternal life is to those who overcome. Don't let your sin cost you your soul. Repent and be renewed. And I want to refer you to James 5, 19 to 20. The erring saint should think about the danger of death, that eternal separation of God. And as we draw breath, we still have the chance to come back to God and make it right. And we invite you to do that this morning. The waters of baptism await. The prayers of the congregation await. The forgiveness of God awaits. Whatever your request, let it be known. All together we stand and while we sing.